pieces of World War III are interlocking together. That is a huge, huge fulfillment of prophecy. The enemy is the author of confusion and terror. If you want reality, go to another commentator. Get in that word. Start listening to God. Jesus said, I have overcome the world. The title of the message is How to Defeat Fear in 2024. Underneath that, I have on my notes why you don't have to be afraid. Why you don't have to be afraid. Our scripture is found in Luke, the 21st chapter. And Jesus is speaking to the disciples. They have great interest as to how things are going to line up. What is the future of Israel? What will be the future of the nation? They don't have a, a God-given insight. They have a very limited insight as to what this means. They are still looking for an earthly government. They are still at the point where they believe that Jesus and the Messiah, they believe him to be the Messiah, the, the chosen one, the called one, they believe him to be the Messiah, but they have a misunderstanding as to the full intent and the breadth of the work of the chosen one, the called one, the Messiah, the anointed one, what that work would accomplish. They thought Jesus was coming to establish an earthly kingdom and to bring peace to Israel governmentally and on the earth at that time. And they're asking what the future is going to look like. They have great interest in that. So Jesus begins to expound that to them. And it's very much beyond their understanding, as it is even for us today, because the prophecy that Jesus gives to them is that which can only really be fully understand as it is fulfilled before your eyes. It is almost like a scroll that is not fully revealed until it is unrolled. And so here we have before us in Luke, the 21st chapter, we're delving right into Jesus' discourse in the book of Luke, which we've chosen to use today, about what's going to happen in the future. So let's begin with verse 21. And it says, And there shall be signs in the sun and moon and stars, and upon the earth distress of nations, in perplexity for, in perplexity for the roaring of the sea and the billows, men fainting for fear and for expectation of the things which are coming on the world. For the powers of the heavens shall be shaken, and then they shall see the Son of Man, which is a reference Jesus referring to himself. When identifying with humanity, there were times in the scripture that he referred to himself as the Son of Man. They shall see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now Jesus would reconfirm these words before the Sanhedrin in a few weeks at, during the course of his trial. When he stands before their quote unquote Supreme Court, Israel's Supreme Court in Jerusalem, they ask him whether he is the Son of God and he breaks the silence and he tells them that he is. And then he goes on, he further seals his own fate by saying, and you will see the Son of Man, the Son of God coming in the cloud with power and great glory. And so here we see an, uh, uh, the, the prevailing atmosphere, the prominent characteristic, one of the prominent characteristics of the age immediately preceding the return of Jesus Christ to this earth. One of those characteristics will be a, a, an atmosphere of great fear, an atmosphere of dread, an atmosphere that in which it will be so thick that even strong men will have heart attacks because of the expectation, seeing what is coming, what they see on the horizon. And surely we're living in those days as we have seen things begin to align as never before. In fact, uh, as I said, Iran launching this attack upon Israel. Now, Israel has been attacked before. We know that Israel is totally surrounded by her enemies. But I hope that you understand that Israel becoming a nation again after two millennia of them being away has never, been, has never taken place in the history of the world. No nation has ever become a nation again after having been destroyed and dispersed as, as Israel has. And that is a huge, huge fulfillment of prophecy. 
And so they are where God said they would be, where Jesus said they would be, just prior to the lining up of all of the events that would hearken and herald the return of Jesus Christ. Even this morning, you know, those individuals that are experts in these matters of war, not only experts in regards to prophecy and the Bible, but experts in regard to military and nations are beginning to get alarmed. It is beginning to look as if we're seeing things line up almost to the point of Ezekiel, the 38th chapter. We see Russia is amassing her troops on the north, northern border of Israel. We see Syria lining up. Now we have an attack from Iran. It could be that we're beginning to see the, the key players that are mentioned within Ezekiel 38. We have not seen that up to this point. Never before have we seen an alignment like this. Now, whether, whether God is going to hit the pause button, I don't know. We don't know. There are spasms, as you've heard me speak before, on prophecy, what the coming, the signs of the coming of the Son of God can be likened to birth pains. And those birth pains have sometimes an interlude of peace between them. But nevertheless, those birth pains are persistent and they become more consistent as the birth approaches. And so the time period between the contractions lessens. And that is indeed what we're experiencing in real time in your life and in my life at this very moment. We're seeing those signs that have been foretold for a couple of millennia and even longer than that in the Old Testament. We're seeing them begin to be fulfilled. We're seeing these contractions of prophecy taking place and we're seeing the time frame shortened in between those contractions. So much so that it's beginning to alarm even individuals that may or may not be believers in the Bible or in, in Jesus Christ. This this morning, I read of uh, the warning of retired Brigadier, Brigadier General Blaine Holt, who said, and I quote, the pieces of World War III are interlocking together. He said, we as a nation need to be alert. And he was warning actually our current administration. He said the pieces of potentially World War III are beginning to interlock together. So we see the, this, these warning signs, we see these ominous clouds of darkness and impending storm on the horizon, and I have just really isolated the relationship of nations together. We've not mentioned any other of the societal ills and the challenges and the, the, the falling away that we're witnessing all around us. Every direction you look, there are dark clouds on the horizon. So certainly, the scripture that we read, certainly our day is beginning to fit into that time period when Jesus said the prominent, one of the prominent features of the atmosphere of society and the world of that age in which this happens will be an atmosphere of fear. We're living in a time when only ones who are not that are not afraid are those who are purposely or innocently ignorant, perhaps, of the conditions around them, either they're too young or, many, or perhaps mentally they don't have the capacity to understand what is happening. Those people are unafraid. Or there are those who are living in a self-medicated state of numbness and have created in themselves a condition of almost comatose. We see that increasing all over our world as millions of individuals are self-medicating in an effort to stop the pain and probably stop the fear and terror that reigns within their minds. And the only way they can do that is to, is to overcome that fear with medication. And then there are those who just simply cut themselves off from all news, from all indications. They're consumed with the distractions of, of themselves. There are those literally out west that live off the grid, that live out, out, on, out in places where there is no cell phone coverage. And I'm talking about young people that have enough money to just literally live disconnected from this world. Those individuals may not have any fear because they don't have any understanding. But for those of us 
who have any sense of intelligence whatsoever and are in touch whatsoever, as I said, there are incredibly dark clouds immediately on the horizon heading towards us, and we're, we know we're going to have to go through some very, very tough times. Mental illness is increasing. Anxiety is increasing. Just this past week in Columbus, I heard a former speaker, I was present when a former speaker of the house pleaded in a very passionate uh, speech to those leadership of the house and senate that were in the audience to increase funding for mental health care. And his plea was met with a thunderous applause because people are battling fear. Now God knew all this would happen. He is not caught off guard. Our God and the Lord Jesus did not recognize that you and I living in this day would face these challenges. He knew it was coming. And for us, he has provided his followers, those who are following him, a pathway to defeating fear. And I want us to cover that if we can very quickly here in the next few moments. How then can you and I defeat fear fear in 2024. And let me pause and interject this. I do not wish to advance the thought that you and I would never ever as believers battle fear because that's not reality. The enemy is, is the accuser of the brethren. He's the accuser of Christians. He's the accuser of those whom God loves. And the enemy is the author of confusion and terror. And so you and I are living in a world in which we will be confronted by circumstances, both individually and as a, in the nation, as a society, of those conditions which will, which will threaten your peace and threaten your hope and threaten your faith. And you will have to fight the battle against fear. Please don't misunderstand that I am somehow promoting an idea that as a follower of Jesus Christ, you will be totally 100% of the time at peace in your heart and never have to fight the battle. No, remember I have, I have said that how to defeat fear in 2024 is the title of this message. We are going to have to overcome fear. David said, David, the young man who ran out into a valley against a giant that thousands of soldiers refused to go face, David who defeated Goliath, he himself said, at what time I am afraid, I will trust in you. At what time I am afraid, I will trust in you. I will defeat that fear by trusting in you, O God. So today, let us quickly look, how can you and I defeat fear in 2024? First of all, very basic, and, but it's starting with point number one, you have to enter a new contract. You have to enter a new contract. In his book that was written in 1936, American writer Stephen Vincent Benet wrote a book that later became a movie called The Devil and Daniel Webster about a New Hampshire farmer named Jabez Stone who had run into a string of bad luck for so many years that he said it's enough to make one sell their soul to the devil. And ironically, the next day, uh, an, an individual showed up named Mr. Scratch, according to this fictional story, and he offered a contract to Mr. Stone for seven years of prosperity and peace if he would sign away his soul, and he did. And seven years later, Mr. Scratch came to make good on the contract and collect the man's soul, the farmer's soul. Well, he reneged and he wanted more time. He tried to bargain and Mr. Scratch wouldn't hear of it. So the farmer, fictionalized, of course, hired Daniel Webster, a famous orator and politician and attorney of the day, to defend him and get him off the hook. And according to the book and according to the movie, Daniel Webster was able to trick the enemy, trick the devil, and Jabez Stone was freed from his contract. Well, I tell you, there is no earthly lawyer that can get you and I out of the contract that we were born under. We were all born under the contract, a contract of the devil. Now, why is that? Because we were born with sin in us. We didn't, we didn't learn it. 
We didn't have to somehow figure out what sin was. It was already in us because we are all sons and daughters of Adam. We have been born with that nature in us and we've been born under a contract because of that sin, literally, with the devil and with sin. The Bible says in Romans 3.23, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Every individual, every person, every one of us, no matter who, we've all, that innocent little baby is born with a sin nature. And as you've heard me say many times, you have to say no far more than you say yes. Why is that? Because we're born with that nature. Not un unfortunately, the Bible tells us because of that sin, we are under the curse of sin. We're born under the curse of sin. We're born under a contract, literally. We're, we, we're a contract that, that we are doomed, and the Bible says the wages of sin, the paycheck of sin is death. We're all born with the stamp of death on our forehead. And because of this, we're under what the Bible calls a contract or a curse of sin. We needed someone. We needed someone to come and break the power of this contract and provide a new one. Someone far greater than Daniel Webster. We needed someone that could break the power. And that's why God sent Jesus, the second Adam. He came in the flesh. But the difference was he had no sin. He wasn't born under sin. He hadn't signed any contract. He was the only one. And through his death, the Bible says, he freed us and broke the power of death. It says in Hebrews 2, 14 and 15. And it says that because of that, he could release us who believe in him. And that word believe is strong. It is not just mental assent who believe in him, we are released from the fear of death. All our lifetime, we were under the curse and the fear of death. Who broke that fear? Who broke that contract? Who had the power to do that? Christ did, and he paid for it by his death on the cross. Matthew 26, 28, he said, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sin. In Romans, the eighth chapter, it says that he has set us free from the law of sin and death. He has set us free from the law of sin and death. And in Colossians, the second chapter, there's a very interesting group of scripture that if you wanted to delve into the depth of it, it talks about in legal terminology, it says that he nailed to the cross, God the Father nailed to the cross the writing of, of that legal contract that was against us. We had a legal contract against us and God is a God of righteousness, but Christ through his death, that contract was nailed to the cross and on it literally was said paid in full. And so the contract was broken and the opportunity was given to us. In other words, Jesus' death on the cross provided for us a way to get out from under the contract we are all born under. It canceled the right of the devil on your soul and on your future. But each of us, each of us has to choose to sign that new contract. It's not automatic. Because Jesus died doesn't mean now everyone that's born is out from under the contract. No, each of us has to choose. That's why this is going on right now. That's what's happening at this moment. The Bible says, the Bible calls what I'm doing right now the foolishness of preaching. Why does it call it that? Because in the eyes of the people who are dying and going to hell, those people who are perishing and blind, what I'm doing right now is one of the most stupid things you could ever do. To gather in a parking lot, to go sit in a sanctuary and listen to somebody do what I'm doing seems like total foolishness. What a total waste of time. But the Bible says it's through the preaching of the cross. It's through the preaching of the gospel, the good news, that we are able to invite people to make that decision to turn away from the devil, to turn away from that contract, and to turn towards the contract that is offered through Christ. Amen.
The Bible says in Revelation 21st chapter, some of the last verses in the Bible, God makes the plea again to humanity. He said, whoever wants to, whoever desires, whoever chooses, come and drink of the water of life freely. But it's up to you. It's up to me. Secondly, the way we defeat fear in 2024 is to listen to another commentator. To listen to another commentator. After we have signed a new contract, we've come out from under the old contract, and we have a new contract, a new covenant, and we're no longer under the curse of death. That's the second death, or hell. We're no longer under that curse. Then we need to begin to listen to another commentator. If all you listen to is and only are the reporters of this world, you're going to be filled with terror. You're not going to have any hope. You're not going to have any faith. You, all, you, all you are going to see is gloom and doom. You will not be encouraged. You will see a very, very dark future with no hope. You remember Jesus often used the phrase when he was teaching, he would sometimes say this, you have heard it said. Well, when you hear that, you know that he's going to go on and say, but I say to you, but I say to you, and we would use that today. You have heard it said on this newscast and on this YouTube program and on this and on the commentary. You have heard it said, but Jesus would say to you and I, but I say unto you, and that is, a, that is an indication we need to listen. Listen to a different commentator. Jesus said in John 10, 27, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. There is another source of news, ladies and gentlemen, and it's called the gospel. And the word gospel means good news. There's another source of news in this day in which terror is pressing in on everyone and that is there's another commentator and the commentator is God and the good news is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, this is not a source that denies reality. In fact, if you want a commentary on where we are really at, this is the place to go. That's why I'm not alarmed. I am not surprised that Iran shot missiles at Israel. I am not surprised at all because the Bible says that is what is coming. And not only that, but more. Let me tell you, there's a lot more coming that you're going to see on the news. And that's why it's important you be plugged in here and find out what the future is going to look like. I'm talking about reality that you watch on the news or on the internet. Let's call that reality with a lowercase r, but reality with a large case r is found in here. This is reality, and it helps to put all of that into proper perspective. When I temper what I'm hearing with this, then I recognize I don't need to be afraid. And in many ways, we're all subject to that in looking at the little r. And we do it sometimes inadvertently. For example, we use phrases like, wasn't it a beautiful sunrise? Wasn't it a beautiful sunset? Well, <laughs> that's not accurate. The sun did not rise this morning. It may look to you, your reality and our reality may seem like the sun rose, but in reality, you're sitting on a planet that's spinning at about a thousand mile an hour. And it makes one rotation every 23 hours and 52 minutes. And we round it up. The reality is the sun didn't rise, the earth is spinning. And it spun, it spun again. That's reality. If you want reality, go to another commentator. And that will help us defeat fear. Number three, yield to another comforter. Jesus said, I will pray the Father and he'll give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. We don't need to face the future without comfort. And God has provided a comforter that is beyond all other comforters. Jesus taught his disciples about the Holy Spirit during their last night together and in the upper room and he told them about the Holy Spirit again. They didn't know what, they, they didn't know what he was talking about. They know the Spirit of God used to come on prophets and they would begin to act different and they would begin to do different things. They even remembered hearing that the Spirit of God would come on Samson 
And they remember the stories that when the Spirit of God came on him, he became supernaturally strong, incredibly strong. So they knew that. But when Jesus said that he was sending the Holy Spirit as a comforter, they didn't know what that meant. And he said that four times, four separate times in three chapters. When Jesus mentioned something four times in three chapters, that's a sign for you and I, and it was for them, listen up, I'm trying to tell you something. Now the word comforter comes from the Greek word paraclete, or parakletos, which means para, para means close or alongside. The prefix para means close or alongside. And the kaleo or kletos means a calling or assignment. So in other words, Jesus said, I'm going to send someone to you who will be with you all the time, whose assignment is to come up close to you and stay close to you all of your life. After you become a follower of Jesus, Jesus was saying, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit to you and you can't see him, but his assignment from the Father is to come alongside of you. When you wake up, he is there. When you go to bed, he is there. When you are going through struggles, he's there. When you are perhaps falling short, he is there. And his assignment is to comfort, to come alongside Paraclete and to help you and to help you make it with victory through this life. You have another comforter. Now, the presence of that comforter is often determined by our closeness to God. The Bible says, God said, come close to me and I'll come close to you. So whether or not we sense the comforter is often a matter of how close we live to God. But I would encourage you to embrace the Holy Spirit today. Invite the Holy Spirit to come close to you. Embrace him. It's more than yielding to the Holy Spirit. God doesn't want us just to yield. Jesus said, Jesus said, to him who is thirsty, let him drink. Not to him who is low, but thirsty, let him or her drink. And so I encourage you this morning to embrace the Holy Spirit. Invite the Holy Spirit. Hunger for the Holy Spirit. Long for the Holy Spirit. Desire the Holy Spirit. And he, who is a personality, he is the third person of the Godhead, will make himself known to you and he will strengthen you and comfort you. We have a hope and a help. We have a comforter that the world doesn't have. None of us like to go where we're not wanted. If we have a choice, I'm certainly not going to a gathering where I know I'm not wanted. And the Holy Spirit does not want to go where he's not wanted. You say, I'm a believer of Christ. Have you let him know that you want him in your life? Have you let the Holy Spirit know that you long for his presence? You desire him. He longs to go where he's longed for. And so I encourage you to yield and to embrace another comforter. Finally, the way we defeat fear in 2024 is we enjoy we know that we enjoy a different conclusion. We have a different conclusion. Regardless of what the storm clouds are on the horizon of your life, or of this world, or of our nation, or of our future, regardless, the Bible says that if I'm under a new contract, and if I'll listen to a different commentator, and I'll embrace another comforter, the Bible says that I have a guaranteed end. The Bible says that I have a future. God said, I know the, the desires I have for you. I know that I want to give you a hope and a future, regardless, outside the power of this world, outside of any governmental in, um, administration, God has a future for his people guaranteed. In this life, and in the life to come. The one in this life is found in John the 16th chapter, verse 33. Jesus started with some bad news. He said, and I told you, the Bible's, a re Bible's reality. 
This isn't just something to take you like a drug out of the reality. Jesus said to his disciples, and he says it to you and I, he says, in this world, you're going to have tribulation. Jesus was just trying to get them ready. In this world, you're going to have tribulation. That's what we're doing here. That's what I'm seeking to do. I tell you that there is a shaking coming. We're headed into some rough times. I guarantee you. We're headed into some rough times. There is a shaking coming. And for the last few years, in all of my ministry, I have never felt God's thumb in my back to try to prepare people for what's coming as I have in the last few years. I told my wife as I was going through the messages yesterday, some of my, um, the file on my computer, I just realized that I have preached four times in the last two years on the subject of hope. I've never done that in my ministry. I have preached several times on battling fear. I have never done that in my ministry. God keeps bringing me back to consistent themes. Why does he do that? Because he knows he wants you to be ready. He wants me to be ready. And one of the things Jesus told his disciples was this. He said, you're going to have tribulation. He said, I'm sorry, guys. I know you don't want to hear this. And they didn't want to hear it. I, I, there's no record in the Bible of them clapping their hands or jumping up and down and saying, awesome. Thanks for sharing that, Jesus. That was great. Nowhere did it record that. These are real men. They're in scary times. They don't really know what's going on. They're following this guy and everywhere this guy goes, they see miracles, but they also see like a world war erupting around him. And they're thinking, boy, I don't know if I want to be connected with him or not. And Jesus said, you're going to have tough times, tribulation, stirred up times. But then he goes on. But be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. Be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. I have taken, you haven't seen it yet, but it's going to be sealed. The deal's going to be sealed. I'm going to die. It's going to look really bad. It's going to look really, really not good. You're going to all run. You're going to all leave me. But just understand that I'm sealing the deal. And, and after three days, I'm going to rise again. And that's going to be proof I have overcome everything. This world, the devil, wicked humanity, the power of the enemy, every and any ballistic missile that the enemy can throw at me, I have overcome it. And he said, and because I have overcome it, you will also, through me, overcome it. You are overcomers. It's going to be tough, but in the midst of it, remember, we're going through this. Remember, you are an overcomer. That's where your faith has to take hold. So we have a future in this life, not just pie in the sky, not just out there yonder when all of this is over and we're all gathered, as the song says, on the other shore. I'm talking about right now where you live. Jesus said, you have a future. You have a hope. You, because you're under a new contract, listen to the new commentator. Listen to another commentator. Get in this commentary. Get in this and, and yield and embrace the, the comforter because you have a different conclusion than those who do not know me. That's what Jesus is saying. Those who do not know me, they don't have the same end. They have reason to worry. They have every reason to be terrified. It's no wonder they're drinking up and shooting up. It's no wonder they're taking the pills because they don't have the conclusion you have. I have purchased the conclusion for you with my own blood, both now in this life and I have a different conclusion in the next life, in the future. The Bible tells us the Bible says that this world is passing away. And it goes on to say, but no eye has seen, no ear has heard, and no one's heart has imagined all the things that God has prepared for those who love him. 
You know, the Bible says in Revelation 21, 1, John said, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Hang on to that thought because we're going to be talking more about that in the future. I'm doing some study right now on the new earth and on the new heaven. And it's going, some of this is going to blow your mind. It's blowing my mind. I've had some misunderstandings of what the future for us is going to be. But, but hang on because we're going to be talking about the new earth. You know, you're, you're not, your future is not to float around on some kind of cloud and to kind of, when I go to shake your hand, if, 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 when we get to heaven, my hand goes through your hand. That's not, that's not, that's Hollywood. That's not, we're not ghosts in heaven. The Bible says that God is going to give us glorified bodies. That was his original intention. What we have around us here was his original plan. His original plan was that man live forever on this beautiful planet called Earth, and that's why he gave us bodies. If we're just going to live in some kind of a eternity that, that is not real, God wouldn't give us new bodies. He wouldn't give you a body. Why would you need a body? The reason you need a body is because we're coming back here. We're coming back here. We're coming back to this earth. Heaven, you, people misunderstand heaven as meaning something that doesn't have substance. Heaven has, all, heaven has substance. There are trees there that, that bloom and bring forth their fruit every month. There are rivers there. The Bible talks about heaven. And we're going to be talking about that. It is going to be fabulous. It is going to be fantastic. The, one more clue. Revelation says that we are going to reign. That word is rule. God's people are going to rule where? On earth. On earth. We're going to rule here. God is not going to destroy everything. God is going to renew everything because this was his original plan. So regardless of what happens, ladies and gentlemen, as a child of God under a new contract with a comforter, and I'm listening to a different commentator, I have a future I have a future that this world can't dictate, and that helps me to defeat fear and terror. So let's close this. Lack of fear in your heart does not mean a vacuum. Your heart is never just a vacuum. You say, well, I don't have any fear in my heart now. It's not a vacuum. Your heart always has something in it. And so lack of fear does not mean that my heart is just void of any feeling whatsoever. And the opposite of fear is faith and hope. And so when there is an absence of fear in your heart because of what God has done and is doing, that your heart will naturally, the opposition to, to fear is faith and hope. That's the antonym to fear. And that's why David said, at what time I am afraid, I will trust in you. I will replace that fear with hope and faith. I think there's a lot of Christians who have allowed squatters to come into their heart. We have a lot of squatters in the cities across America now who go into a place that's not theirs, and they take it over. And some of these liberal cities have such laws of insanity and interpretation, anti-constitutional, unconstitutional interpretations of the law, that the squatters have ended up with more rights than the legitimate homeowner of the house. I just read a couple weeks ago where one lady was arrested because she changed the locks on her own house. And the squatters had more right to the house. Now, I, I'm just going to tell you that is literal insanity. And that is the level of, of what we are up against. But I've got good news for you. God is not like a liberal mayor or a liberal governor. Our God... Our God 
is a God of justice. And he knows who owns your heart. And if you've got squatters of fear and squatters of terror and squatters of anxiety and squatters of dread and squatters of doom and depression, squatting in the house of your heart, you have every right, according to God, in fact, you have a responsibility to go give them the boot and kick them out. And as you embrace the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will help you kick them out. And sometimes, unfortunately, those squatters are there because we gave them access through our own words and through our own actions. You speak doom, you speak gloom, you speak negative, you speak depression, you speak it all the time and you open the door for the squatters to come into your heart. You act like it, you watch it, you feed on it, you dwell on it, you never read his word, you never listen to another commentator, you never invite the Holy Spirit of the Comforter in, you just act passive and you wonder why there are squatters in your heart. They're there because you opened the door. And so how do you get them out? You begin to talk a different way and you take the authority that Jesus Christ has given you. You walk up to the door of your heart and you begin to declare who you are in Christ and say, I am not subject to fear. I am not in bondage to the devil. I'm not subject to the devil. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I'm no longer a slave to the enemy. Get out of my heart. Get out of my life. And I'm going to begin to fill my heart with the things of God and I'm going to begin to speak what God says instead of what NBC, MSNBC, ABC, Fox News, CNN says, I'm going to say what God says. And God says, I am more than a conqueror. I'm going to begin to say that I'm more than a conqueror. You say, well, it doesn't look like it. I don't care what it looks like. I don't care what the horizon says. My God says I am more than a conqueror. My God says I'm going to come through this. My God says I don't need to fear. And I'm going to tell you, you've got to stand strong on it. Don't let them get a foot in the door of your heart. Don't let them get a foothold in the door of your mind. They'll come at all hours. They'll come in the middle of the night. The the devil will come and he'll try to get a road into your heart. Stand firm on the word of God. Stand firm in the Lord and he will help you. Do you say you won't have a battle? You will have a battle, but be of good cheer. He has overcome the world and we need not be subject to terror. When the rest of the world is falling apart and chewing their nails and shooting up and drinking up, we can have some something supernatural in us that is beyond us because it comes from God. How to defeat fear in 2024. If it wasn't true, God wouldn't have promised it to us. Can you say amen? Are you under a new contract? You you can be today. But I'm going to tell you something. This stuff of saying you signed a new contract and you live the way you always lived is a bunch of baloney. It's time for us to declare our God is a God of holiness and righteousness. You can't sign a new contract, get out from under the one of the devil and live like the devil. You're going to have to live a new way. Can I get an amen? So don't tell me you signed a new contract and you're living the way you always did. That doesn't cut it but God will help you live as you ought to live. It's time for us as a people of God to demonstrate the power that Christ has given us as the church. Let's stand. And if you can, under a new contract, then ladies and gentlemen, start listening to a new commentator. Get in that word. Start listening to God. Embrace the comforter. And by the way, let's look forward. I'm telling you the future is awesome. I'm, we're going to be describing it as much as we can in, in a few services to come, but the future, a new earth, this is awesome. You and I are going to look back on this and say, do you remember when we talked about this? And here it is. Fantastic. Let's go encouraged in the Lord for God is on our side and we are on his. Amen.